Welcome to Worth the Effort Woodworking. In today's video, we're going to be making a simple miter box. Uh, people see me use these in, the, in my videos quite a bit, and some, I've gotten some comments on it, so I thought it was time I took a little bit, a couple hours, and created a video to show you how I make them. They really only take 5 or 10 minutes to make once you figure them out. And when I teach this little exercise in class, it takes a class about 30 minutes for that very first one. But you also have to understand I'm explaining a lot of tool tips, techniques. I showed some, some tricks for using tools that a lot of people don't realize they, the tools were designed to be used that way in this simple little box. I really like this project for, for beginning class because uh, it forces students to into proper sawing techniques, especially new students. A lot of students will struggle when they first start sawing in that the saws, they have to focus on not only keeping it online, keeping your thing, all that talk I have about all elbow, shoulders, and stuff, and then the amount of pressure to use. Well, using this device for those first cuts on that very first project they have, I don't have to explain a whole lot because the device itself will reinforce what I talk about. And that way, the students can just kind of concentrate on just the amount of pressure they use on the saw and keeping a fluid motion. Because keeping that linear angle between your knuckles, your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder, all in line like a railroad thing, well, the miter box just kind of forces that. Because if you get out of line whenever you're moving, it just kind of feels more natural to bring it back in. Because a miter box won't fight you in that aspect. So, it makes a good sawing, I don't want to call it crutch, but a training aid for those initial cuts a student has. Plus the fact, you know that those initial cuts will come out square and plumb. So that first project they make has a much higher chance for success. For this is one of those entry level exercises I use to help me teach. But later on down the road, I still use these all the time. And you see me in my videos. And it cracks me up because every time I pull this out, I'm invariably going to get somebody on YouTube saying, hey, that's cheating. Well, okay, so I'm a cheater then. I see nothing wrong with using appliances like this. Hand tool woodworkers use probably more appliances than power tool woodworkers. Think about shooting boards, uh, bench dogs, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of people see me use these things right here. A little bench hook for cutting. All those are appliances to make you more efficient. The reason why I like using a miter box for certain cuts is it allows me a mental break. I don't have to focus so much on keeping the reflection in the saw plate aligned perfectly, making sure it's balanced so it's nice and plump. I can just put the wood in there, put it on the line at the depth, uh, the, disc, the length I want, and saw away. And if I'm having to do a lot of the same stuff over and over and over, this just gives me a chance to mentally check out a tad bit to relax. Because woodworking, especially hand tool woodworking, is more akin to a marathon. If you are having to sprint the entire 36, 26 miles, you're not going to make it. You need to give your body a chance, an effective speed to get the most done in a safe, productive way. And there are times in woodworking where you have to be extremely focused. If I'm cutting the shoulder of a tenant, damn straight, I'm going to reach around, I'm going to grab my square, I'm going to grab my knife, I'm going to make a nice knife line. I might even grab a chisel to create a little V-cut so I can drop the teeth of the saw below the surface of the, of the wood to get a nice clean cut. I will be focusing big time on the reflections in the saw plate. I will be balancing it on my center finger to make sure it's dead on plumb. I will be using all the tricks and techniques I know to make that perfect shoulder. But again, if I'm just cutting the board to length and I'm going to be putting that shoulder on later on, I just got to make sure it's plumb 90 degrees so I can check out a little bit making that cut. Plus, you see, I make these a lot of times if I'm making repetitive cuts. Uh, if you're inlaying Texas stars and tables or boxes or stuff like that, if you're like me, you're going to make a dozen at a time. A small production run to make it effective, for, uh, efficient for you to sell that stuff at a profit. So a Texas star, you know, those bases are going to have basically 10 identical cuts. 
Well, yes, I could get my angle gauge. I can mark those all out. I could do all that kind of stuff and make those perfect cuts. Or I could spend five minutes, make one of these at that angle, and I could make those five cuts per star, and then I could make 12 more stars for a total of uh, 60 cuts, all that angle. And I could do it fairly quickly and efficiently. So to me, this ain't cheating. This is smart woodworking. So, come along, let's build one of these. I'll show you a few layout tips and techniques and uh, some ways to use tools uh, to the best advantage. So, first let's look at how we use a miter box. This design I have, the slot is slightly offset because I'm right-handed. So I'm going to be holding the work on the right side and sawing on the left. And it just makes more sense to move the uh, slot over to accommodate that. So, if you're left-handed, you might want to move the slot over to this side. And about a third of my boxes are left-handed guide for the students. You also want some way to brace it. A simple lip on the edge works great because I can just push against it and use my body weight as a clamp. So, I come over here, I drop my wood in my box, I get to the proper length, I come over and using proper sawing techniques with a proper foot facing backward, my toes facing the way I'm sawing, my shoulders at 45 degrees, I drop my saw in there and using the slightest of pressure, notice I have very light hand, hand grip, I start moving the saw, I can move across the front, I can come down the face and then I can ride it up and come down. Now notice, I want to be able to stop before I hit my workbench. So when I design these, these miter boxes, I tend to design them for a specific saw. And all my students use the same saw, so all the dimensions are the same. So, the reason why this particular box has a cutout right there is so that the back of my saw hits that and is, acts as a stop. Most of my boxes, I just picked the wrong scrap when I built this particular one, are designed so that when they hit the top, that's my base. And that's how we're going to do it. Which means, this board right here, and coincidentally the one in back, are designed to be this distance plus the thickness of the wood. Now, why do I not have the back the same height? Because I want to teach proper sawing technique. And that involves starting on the board on this side, being able to drop the back to line across the top and then straightening it up. And by having this saw this design that way, they can bring it down a little bit farther than they can in the front. So, the first thing to do is find the saw you're going to be using, take that measurement, add in the thickness of the board, and then make a nice parallel cut for the two sides. Now, coincidentally, I just rip a long board and the center section happens to be the same distance. You can make the center section pretty much as big as you want, but don't make it too big because remember, you end up, when you're sawing with these things, you're only using the front part of the saw because of where the wood is. So you're only sawing on this much of the saw. You're not going to go the full distance because when you come back out, it's hard to keep it in line. So the shorter you make that distance right here, the more of the saw you're actually going to be able to use. And proper sawing technique, which this is not, this is one of the downsides of this, you want to use all the saw teeth. There's pluses and minuses of everything. So the center board, make the thickness you want. You want to be able to get the work that you're using in there, but the shorter the better. Okay, in my example, I'm just using big box store. It's, they call it one inch, but it's actually three quarters inch, just because it's very common. And if I ever do long cuts, I just find a scrap I can put out here. I can miter here and it keeps it up at the same angle. I, that's just what I use and I end up making a new one of these every few months or if I have a special need. Now, I have three boards identical. It doesn't matter if you have them identical length. I just happen to have do that for myself, but they can be just about any length as long as they're long enough to, to work. Now, the most important tool that you're going to be using in here besides your body is you have to have a very accurate 90 degree square because this is going to be a 90 degree miter box. If you're making a miter box for like 45 degrees or any degrees in between, you not only need a 90 degree square that's very accurate, but you need a very consistent square that is at that angle so that you can mark all the layouts. 
This one's strictly 90 degrees, so we just, all our cuts are going to be 90. So you just need to make sure that this is perfectly square. And the easiest way to do that one is to grab a pencil or a knife, find a straight edge, mark a line one direction, flip it over, mark the line, lay the line out the other direction. And if those two lines are right on top of each other, you have a 90 degrees. If they are off one way or the other with a wooden square, you can square it up fairly quickly just by planing off a little bit more from one side than the other. With a metal square, there are techniques for uh, taking a peen and dinging it to bend the metal a little bit, but that's for another pod, another video. Okay, so I have my three pieces right here, and I'm going to lay, make this one my bottom, this one my back, this one my front. And I'm going to make this my waist side. And that is going to be incredibly important in a later step. Make sure you mark your waist side consistently. Okay. Now this piece right here, the bottom, is the most important one that we have to be dead on accurate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my square. And because I am right handy, I'm going to be sawing on this side of the board, holding on this side. I'm going to make a very deep knife line and to be accurate with your knife remember the first pass just slightly kisses the wood making a slice indentation the second pass is a little firmer the third pass is even firmer and then you can make as many subsequent passes as you want the thing is you just don't want the wedging action of the knife itself to move your your plate that's why the first one just barely kisses it because it creates a slice indentation in there and your pressure of holding your pinky or your middle finger up here and your thumb down here so that the pressure on sideways is always breaks if you don't have a finger up here bracing along the side there's a it's very easy to move over you want that finger right there clamped on in so you have pressure on all sides of the of the device and that way it doesn't move over so you get a nice straight line. Then you want to put these three boards back together. And this is where I say it doesn't really matter the, the length because if they're a little bit off, it's okay. I just kind of like it to be all the same. I think it looks good. I'm going to put my weight down on them to hold them still. I'm going to put my knife in that knife line with the base going, the, the flat portion going the same way, the bevels going the same way in that knife line and I'm just going to make a neck. Going to do the same thing over here. Okay, so that way I now have a neck. I now need to mark the front and the back all the way around. This one I am now done with. Okay, I don't have to worry about that one. So on these two I need to mark my knife all the way around. So I'm going to use a technique I call relative marking. And that is to compensate for any error. Now, we've ma already made sure this is very accurate, but over a long distance going all the way around, if it is a quarter of a degree or an eighth of a degree off, we might find it out. But if we use our, this relative technique, that eighth of the degree off will be balanced on both sides, so it will be negligible for woodworking. Woodworking doesn't have to be micron accurate. So, on this example, this nick mark right here is my relative edge right there and i'm going to be marking these using the reference side on that reference edge on both directions that way you can see that any error is going to be the same on both sides now if i were to mark it this way then this way then this way you can see that i've just quadrupled the error instead of complementing it so, here we go. Mark it out. I put my knife in my nick and make those one, two, three. I then go to the other side and notice my reference is closest to my reference edge. And I transfer that line over. One, two, three. I come over to this side and notice my reference is closest to my reference edge. If I were to put it on this side of the board, it would be farther away. And also, my two angles, if there was any error, 
would not be the same. So the reference goes closest to the reference edge. I can't see my knife line over here, but I can feel it by dragging my knife line across and click right there. It just popped in. One, two, three. Then I come over to this side, reference edge, closest to my reference edge, drop my knife in my knife line, it clicked right in, then one, two, three, and what do you know, it lines up perfectly all the way around. Do the same to the other side and come back. Okay, I'm now putting a little lead in my lines just to make it easier for y'all to see it on the camera. I normally do not do this simply because I find the pencil makes it harder for me to be accurate because I'm trying to split that knife line and the pencil actually colors on both sides of the knife line. So it's, it just makes it more difficult for me. But for the camera, I'm going to be doing it that way. Okay, so now I have my front, my back, and my, and my back, my base, and my front, the two sides are marked all the way around. And I've got my waist marked on each one of them. Okay, so now I need to make it so that I end up with a small lip in back. And I'm going to be using screws and glues to assemble it. The screws are going to act like a clamp until the, until the glue, glue uh, sets simply because I don't have a lot of clamps in the school and this is just kind of the pattern I got into with these. So I want to be able to mark the screw holes for those screws up a little bit. So here's the easiest way I know to do that one. Take a pencil. This is my base. I want to put screws in the dead center of this through this board. So I will take my pencil line and I will simply mark it on both sides. to give me a center point mark for my screw holes. On the front side, what I will do is I will mark the base just like that. And since all these boards are the same width, I'm just going to put the back on it and mark the other side. Now that gives me two lines on the front for me to drill holes in the dead center of them that will hit the dead center of the base at my right spot. Just makes life a lot easier to instead pulling out the ruler and measuring stuff and adding in human error just to take your measurements directly off the piece. Easy peasy. Now before we set, assemble this I'm going to make saw cuts on the front and the back of this unit. And those saw cuts are just going to be relief. They're not going to go all the way through because a saw tends to follow the path of least resistance. If I go ahead and make cutouts along these lines when it's easy to cut them straight, then when I do cut it straight on down, it will follow a directly plumb path. So here we go. I'm going to grab my bench hook. And this is the part where students on their first attempt on these typically make the most error because if you don't cut this dead straight now whenever you assemble it, it's going to be slightly off but it's generally not that big a deal because it's over a fairly wide area and here's the bottom of it that's going to be the base that sits on it so I'm going to basically just saw a slight relief to the waist side of the line and that's where this waist side comes important so I come over I drop my fingernail into that knife line so I can reference it I look at my reflection to make the sure the reflection is passing through on both sides to form a straight line. That guarantees that I am plumb. I will nibble a little bit, draw back, just nibble, nibble, get it nibbling. Whenever I breathe out, I breathe along that mice line to get rid of the dust but I'm not going to saw all the way through. Now I come over the top. Notice I was slightly off there. Well, we're going to compensate for that. I'm going to do the same exact thing. Nibble, following that knife line, giving a path of least resistance. Come back over on this side, nibble my way forward, giving it a path of least resistance to follow. 
So now I just have a cut recess on three sides that doesn't go into the middle, okay? But I want you to notice something. I've made sure to stay on this side of the line, on this side of the line. I did not take the line, I split the line on this side. Now, if I had not marked my waist on both of these boards, what would have happened if on this board I had sawed on the other side of the line? That would have introduced an angle to my plum cut. So that's why it's so important to mark that waist side so that you know what side of the line to saw on. So here we go, the other side. Fingernail in the knife line. Nibble my way forward. Come to the top. Fingernail in the knife line. Nibble my way forward. Finger in the knife line. And on this side I have too many pen pencil lines so I'm hoping I'm splitting it. There we go. Now to drill the holes for the screws. Okay, now we are going to pre-drill holes through the side so that they will screw into the base without splitting the side. Especially with pine like this, if you get a thick screw on it, if you don't pre-drill it, it will split the, split the wood. Plus the fact, wood screws are designed to be used where the, uh, the wood that you are securing to the other piece of wood the hole is as thick as the shank. That's why wood screws, towards the head of the screw, there's no threads, because they want it to be able to slip in and out there so it will pull the wood against the other one. If you had threads going all the way to the head, well then it would lock into this board and not pull it into the other board. It'll just hit, it'll hit its base and that'll be it. You want to pull it in. So the hole that we have on the board that we are screwing into the base has to be as wide as a shank. So, if you will notice, I typically will use two drills whenever I'm screwing in screws. The first drill, the size of the bit is as thick as the shank. The second one is as thick as the inside diameter of the threads, not the full threads themselves. And typically in softwoods, it's actually even a little bit smaller so that there's a little bit of compression involved. And on those, I will use a little push drill like this right here. This is a Buck Rogers, I believe, from the 40s or 50s. Now, when you buy these old tools, you can be more accurate with a drill like this than you can with our power drills we use today, like this one. It all comes down to balance. And when you buy these, you want to make sure you get one that still has a knob on the side. The original knob. Because it is all balanced. I want you to notice something. I'm going to zoom in so that you can see it. Okay, I have a piece of plywood here just so that there's a light background so that we can watch what happens. Okay, I'm going to try to hold this drill right on the top with two fingers so that it can swing freely. Okay? And I have the handle in the utmost position. Now, watch what happens when I lower the handle down to the lower position. Did you see that? How the, how the drill straightened up? It is now perfectly plumb with gravity. Whereas when I'm in the upper position, it's slightly offset. And that has to do with the, the center of gravity. When it's up here, the center of gravity is farther in this way. When it's down here, the center of gravity is farther out that way. And that all compensates with the weight of the handle. If you didn't have the weight of the hand, that knob right there, it would be wandering one way or the other. So when you line this tool up, you want to line it up with a handle on bottom and find its balance point, and that will be plumb, assuming your, the workbench underneath it is plumb. Now, Try doing that with this thing. Yeah, there's no way you're going to find plumb but based on balance. So let's take advantage of that balance aspect of these pre-drills to dr drill straight down through. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the back side, which I've got that pencil line in here, so I just need to find this roughly the center, and I'm going to hang it off the edge, simply because I do not want to drill into my workbench. That would not be a good thing. So I grab my mallet, 
Okay, so here we go. I want to find the center, so I'm using a brad point bit, the, the bit you want to use as a woodworker. I drop it down, I make sure this is here, I find its balance point, and now I'm going to drill straight down. But I'm going to do something different that's going to make you feel stupid and silly when you do it. There is no way I can rotate this around and keep everything steady. I'm just not that coordinated. I doubt most people, more people, that most people are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find its balance point. I'm going to put my hand on top. And I'm going to put my forehead on my hand. And using my ears, the balancing in my ears, I can maintain this top being steady. So I find its balance point. I put my head right there. I'm not pressing down. I'm just kind of keeping it down. I'm going to go backwards one rotation. That will score the hole with the side of the brad point bits. And then I'm going to go forward. And just like that, I drill a hole completely plumb. Now, I, that took a bit of time because I was explaining a lot. But it's not that, that slow. I mean, basically, you just find the thing, find the bounce point, go backwards, and go forward. Boom. There we go. And I would do one on each side of the line and then do a couple on the other side. Easy peasy. And because I go, went backwards, it scored the hole first before I drilled in. I didn't get any tear out on this side. I get nice, clean hole entries. Okay, this next step, we are going to transfer the hole marks from the sides to the base so that we can pre-drill them for the screws. And once again, this is kind of a layout trick that you will be using all over the place. It's just good practice on this one. Now, the key thing is, we need to be very careful of, of placement. Because on the base, we have that knife line, but on the sides, we have the saw curve. So we need to line up the side of the saw curve with the knife line on base. Not Don't just line it up in the center. Line it up on the side. And that's why it was so important to mark the waist side at the very beginning. Because that would tell you what side of the saw curve to line the knife line on. And what I will typically do is I will clamp the base down to my workbench. And on the back side, which is sitting flush, I will line it all up or get it really close. Then I will clamp it with just a little quick clamp to the other piece, just like that. And then if I'm a little bit off, I can tap it one way or the other to get it perfectly lined up. At which point, I will take my drill bit and I will slide it through the hole. And because it's got that brad point, it will make a little indentation into the base on where your hole needs to be. Just verify every time that you have not moved the side piece when you do that. Now, to do the other side, remember the other side is halfway up the board a little bit. The easiest thing I know to do is to take the side that you just drilled through, put it on up underneath it, go to the other side, Clamp them both down, and that will raise it up just the right size for you to mark through. Line everything up again, clamp it down, tap as you need to, and mark your mark way through. So now we have the center board to the hole we need to do. And remember, the other hole was straight plumb through, so now we just need to drill a hole straight plumb straight down. And the re one of the reasons why I like these little uh, push drills is because they are completely balanced. All you have to do is find their balance point, and that will be plumb, assuming your workbench is somewhat plumb. Now, whenever I have classes do it, I always tell the students to clamp down their board so that they don't flex around. Because if they flex, they tend to break these old bits, and they're very expensive to replace. But since this is just me out here, I will just line up the hole. I'll find its balance point. And I will just push down, and that will drill a hole. You 13-year-olds don't laugh about the motion. So while I struggle opening this glue bottle so we can assemble this thing, let's take a blatant self-promoting commercial break. We're at the Effort Woodworking. It's just a little one-man channel where I do my best to provide educational material for you and classrooms around the country in the best way I know a hand. 
but I depend upon people like you who learn stuff from us to help support us. You can visit our website, WorthTheEffort.com, where I have numerous ways you can help support the channel uh, via buying some of the artwork. I scramble on the weekends to sell at various artist markets or farmers markets. I mainly offer some available online too. I also am developing a t-shirt of the month club where you can buy a new t-shirt every month or just buy one, pick and choose the ones you like. Or I do have a donate button if you just feel generous and want to support the channel. So if you believe you will be receiving benefit from us in the future, please consider supporting us or at least spreading the word about the channel so I can educate more people along the way. That big magnus opus of education, that 12 chapter multi-video cha per chapter uh, educational thing that I'm targeting for middle school classrooms is coming along well and I will be producing them as budget allows. Thanks for your support. Okay, so we have the front, back, bottom, and back right here. When you're assembling it, it's best to do the front first because the front is going to be offset so it will brace against the side. So what you do is you put the back underneath, you get ready with the front, you drop a bead of glue down. The glue is what's actually going to hold this together. The screw, screws are there just for alignment and uh, clamping pressure. Okay, so lay that down, clamp it to keep it secure. It doesn't have to be completely flush with the bottom on all sides. And then you can line the front up, wiggle around to spread that glue out, make sure it's lined up. And I'm afraid you're just going to have to do this with hand pressure. Using a power drill with these cheap big box screws they will break left and right so just slide it in and then screw it down and after the first screw goes in check your alignment again if it isn't perfect Go ahead and back that screw out and do another screw. By having four of those holes there, basically it gives you four chances to get it dead on perfect. To do the other side, I just flip it off, pop it down, run a bead of glue, Once again, clamp it, and then drill the screws in. Unfortunately, you have to reach around this time. If you get it right, the knife line from the bottom was going to line up for the knife line on the side, and your saw kerf will be over on the edge. Now, if you get it a little bit off, just unscrew it, wipe off the glue, line it all back up, and drill new holes, uh, totally ignoring the old holes. And just get it right the second time. If you don't get it right that time, do it a third time. Eventually, you're going to get it all lined up. Okay, the last step is to simply saw the rest of the way through the board, and you have your working miter box. I like to do the front first because I can get down and get good angle and then work on the back. I just work on one at a time. So because you have those saw curves in there, you can come down, make that nice easy cut all the way down. And that point I can connect to the other side Just take it nice and slow because there's not much structure there, but you're going to find that it wants to follow that pre-cut because it wants to follow the path of least resistance. And there you go. You now have a working miter box. So let's see how it does. Grab your board, slide it in the box. You can always prop the other end side up. 
Get in the proper sawing stance, drop it in there, close your eyes, look away, do whatever you want, and you end up with a nice square cut. Job done, doesn't take much effort. If you need to make multiple cuts, there's no reason why you can't clap this down, clamp a stop on the edge, Just bump it up, saw, bump it up, saw, bump it up, saw. Miter box, a fairly simple project, but you got to learn a lot about laying, some tricks for laying it out and how to use your different tools, especially the drills and stuff like that. I hope you enjoyed this simple build. It took us longer to talk about than to actually do. You can actually batch these things out in five or ten minutes, as I said in the beginning, once you do, do them once or twice, and make them for lots of different angles or different purposes. It's just a very simple box. There's nothing complex about that. Uh, if you learned something from this video, whether a little tip or technique, you can help us out by subscribing, telling your friends about us, spreading the word. Or if you want to do something a little bit more, visit WorthTheEffort.com. I have a support page where there's a lot more ways you can support us other than monetary benefits. And I want you to remember one last thing. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.